Thank you, Rodney. And uh, welcome to Manti. Good to see everybody. And uh, today I, I would like to address something that I'm sure probably is going to come up on the streets. And that is the issue of uh, the Book of Mormon. As you probably know, the Book of Mormon is a very important aspect of Mormonism to many Latter-day Saints that tends to uh, validate Joseph Smith's claim as a true prophet of God. And of course, the fact that he's a true prophet of God validates the Book of Mormon. It's kind of a little bit of a circular reasoning there with some. But anyway, I thought we could look at some of the uh, arguments that I have at least heard on the streets in my past 30 plus years of dealing with this subject of Mormonism, and that is why we, can't we approach the Book of Mormon with some skepticism? And if you've ever had the same experience that I have many times when they uh, talk to you and you, you want to challenge some of the claims in the Book of Mormon, some Latter-day Saints get a little bit agitated about that. They don't want you to really look closely at what it actually says. They merely want you to use a subjective method in order to determine its truth. And so I want to look at some of the claims for the Book of Mormon, as well as uh, some of the um, arguments that have made in its behalf, and, and hopefully give you some information that you might be able to use later on as this subject comes up when you're talking with people on the streets. First, let me begin with a statement by Orson Pratt, who was a Mormon apostle during the 19th century, during the time of Brigham Young. If you know anything about the teachings of Orson Pratt and Brigham Young, you know that they didn't always agree with each other on a lot of subjects. And time has kind of vindicated Orson Pratt over the years and uh, kind of shown that he was correct and Brigham Young was actually the heretic uh, um, when he was alive. But Orson Pratt made this statement regarding the book. He said, this book must, either be, must be either true or false. If true, it is one of the most important messages ever sent from God to man, affecting both the temporal and eternal interests of every people under heaven to the same extent and in the same degree that the message of Noah affected the inhabitants of the old world. So you can see it's placed on a very, very high pedestal. But he goes on. He says, if it's false, if false, it is one of the most cunning wicked, bold, deep laid impositions ever palmed upon the world, calculated to deceive and ruin millions who will sincerely receive it as the word of God, and will suppose themselves securely built upon the rock of truth until they are plunged with their families into hopeless despair. The nature of the message in the Book of Mormon is such that if true, no one can possibly be saved and reject it, and if false, no one can possibly be saved and receive it. Now, you would probably agree with me, that's a pretty, pretty incredible statement regarding this book. Now, 13th President Ezra Taft Benson, in his book, A Witness and a Warning, on page 51, said, we are not required to prove the Book of Mormon is true or is an authentic record through external evidences, though there are many. I'm going to challenge that later on, but uh, he says it never has been the case, nor is it now that the studies of the learned will prove the Book of Mormon true or false. Now, let me just say that this is kind of a uh, it, it's, it's a kind of a mixed message that's being sent not only to the LDS people, but it's also a mixed message being to, sent to us as non-LDS people. Because while Ezra Taft Benson is saying we're not required to prove the Book of Mormon is true or is authentic through external evidences, which I'm going to assume is through empirical evidence, uh, evidence of historical validity or anthropological validity or even examining its doctrine in light of other authoritative sources. He's basically saying to push all that aside. In other words, to approach the Book of Mormon in this way, to Ezra Taft Benson at least, and to other Latter-day Saints that I've talked to personally, to do other than to merely pray about the book or to get a subjective feeling regarding the book is actually approaching the book in a wrong way. I'm kind of troubled by that because I can tell you from, a, again, a personal experience, I did not come to Christianity 
merely by a subjective experience. I, I was uh, very skeptical about the Bible. Uh, I knew if I was to make a change in my life and start believing what the Bible had to say, it was going to mean a radical departure from my lifestyle as I knew it at the time. I knew that I would probably lose a lot of good friends if I embraced this Bible as truth. And so I had a lot of reasons not to believe the Bible. But yet, through looking at what the Bible had to say on some issues, I came to the realization that even though I was skeptical and trying to prove it wrong in order to save my worldview, I realized that my arguments did not hold up against historical evidence, anthropological evidence, and things like that. Now, I fully admit that I could not prove empirically doctrines in the, more, in the Bible dealing with issues like my forgiveness of sins. There's no way that I can prove with empirical evidence that my sins are forgiven. And I do take those issues by faith based on the promises that are already in the Bible. I'm not making it up. Apart from the word of God, those promises are in it. And I have found that there's enough evidence that I can at least say, look, it's, it's proven to be factual in all these areas. Why couldn't it be factual when it comes to this area? Unfortunately, when it comes to the Book of Mormon, I can't get past set step one. And I've often explained that to Latter-day Saints who keep insisting that, you know, I have to follow Moroni's prayer in, in Moroni chapter 10, and I will be addressing that. James Faust, who passed away, a member of the First Presidency, passed away not too terribly long ago, said, the test for understanding this sacred book is preeminently spiritual. An obsession with secular knowledge rather than spiritual understanding will make its pages difficult to unlock. Now, why did I say that this is a mixed message? Because what do you think they do at BYU? They try to prove the Bible, or the Book of Mormon, in a non-subjective, non-preeminently spiritual manner. They're looking for proofs that will validate some of the stories that are in there. Now, they've been hard-pressed to find them, but they certainly aren't against them because they have whole classes on this subject. And, and again, it, it kind of throws out a mixed message here. Now, speaking of Moroni 10, 4 and 5, it reads, And when you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if you shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things." You are aware, of course, that there is no such test for the Bible worded like this. You won't find anywhere in the Acts of the Apostle where Paul goes into a synagogue and tells people to pray over religious books. He never instructs us to pray over religious books at all. We are always encouraged to examine these things and to prove whether or not the message has some truthful validity to it. And if not, we are commanded that we should reject it. Um, but in Mormonism, this promise seems to be the trump card. It's actually um, what I call, and I'll, I'll get to this, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to follow my notes here this morning. But a question that I have often asked Latter-day Saints that insist that I need to pray about the Book of Mormon. And how many have ever done that? How many have ever prayed about it? I'm not trying to, you know, out you or anything. I, I never have, okay? I, I'll be quite honest with you. I have never prayed according to Moroni, Moroni's prayer. For one, um, I've yet to have a Mormon demonstrate to me that there even was a Moroni who ever said such a thing. Uh, second of all, I don't find it to be really biblical. I, I, again, I mean, if you've done that, I'm not saying, oh my gosh, you sinned. I'm not saying that at all. But I don't feel any um, uh, compelling uh, feature to, to tell me to do that. And unfortunately, when I say this to most Latter-day Saints, the, the first thing that they will think in their mind is, oh, you don't believe in prayer. And I try to explain to them by heading them off at the pass to say, look, it's not that I didn't pray about the Book of Mormon because I don't believe in prayer. It's because I do believe in prayer and I believe prayer is very sacred that I don't believe in abusing the sacred nature of prayer. 
A lot of Mormons don't understand what I mean by that, so usually I have to use an illustration, and, and a, a common illustration that I've used on the streets and talking with Mormons over three decades is, well, you wouldn't pray if it's okay to steal your neighbor's television, would you? And all of them will say, well, of course not. Well, why not? Well, because the commandments say we're not supposed to steal. Ah, so you're going to a written authority in order to determine what, how you should behave when it comes to certain things, correct? And they'll usually agree. And I see these, that's really my reason. Now, I don't mind going through the Book of Mormon. I've read it. I, uh, I've, I've studied the Book of Mormon many, you know, many years. But the question that I want to ask them is this. And I've asked this. I remember I had three missionaries in my home. And I was talking to them specifically about this because they had left me, well, no, they didn't leave me a copy of the Book of Mormon. These guys didn't. I told them I had one, and they wanted me to read it, and they were going to come back the next week, and they were going to ask me some questions about it. I said, well, that would be great, and I would love to talk to you. So, of course, when they came back, they asked if, if I had looked at the book, and I had already told them I did. Uh, and, but I told them that I didn't pray about it, and here's why. I asked them, if I was to follow the advice of Moroni 10, 4, and 5, just hypothetically, if I was to do that, and God answered my prayer by telling me that the Book of Mormon was not true. That's how you're supposed to pray. You're supposed to pray if it's not true. And I got a confirmation that it was not true. Would you leave the church? Would you leave the Mormon church? And of course, all three of them said, no, they wouldn't. Then I say, said to them, I said, this is the problem I have with Moroni's prayer. It's, it's what I call the Mormon Kobayashi Maru. Now, uh, now, I know Glenn was a Star Trek fan, and I thought I'd want to make him feel at home in our great state of Utah. And of course, if any of you are Star Trek fans, you know that the Kobayashi Maru in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, is the no-win scenario that, of course, only Captain Kirk could actually beat. Why? Because he cheated and monkeyed with the computers. But the Kobayashi Maru is this. If you pray according to Moroni's prayer, and you were to say that to a Latter-day Saint, the reason it will have no effect on them is because somehow, somewhere, something was wrong with you, not the book. It's always you. For instance, you have to pray with a sincere heart. If I was to come back and say, well, I prayed and God showed me the book was not true, that Joseph Smith was not a prophet of God and Thomas Monson is not his living prophet, they would be thinking in their mind, well, you didn't pray with a sincere heart. And I asked the missionaries in my home, would that not be true? And they looked at each other kind of sheepishly. I says, guys, if we're going to have a discussion, you've got to be brutally honest with me. Come on, I'm an old man. I can take it. Hit me with your best shot. And they said, you're right. We would probably be thinking about that. Well, it also says you have to have real intent. That's an interesting uh, uh, requirement. I actually asked him more than one time, what does real intent mean? He says, well, you have to want it to be true. And he, and he meant this very sincerely. You have to want it to be true. And I kept thinking, young teenager buying first car, going on to parking lot to look at car, really wanting a car. He's going to buy a car, whether that's the car for him or not. He wants it. And because he has a desire for this thing, naturally that puts a lot of objective thinking off to the side. And how many of us have ever bought a car that we really wanted, only to find out after we bought it, if God really wanted us to have that car, it was only to teach us a lesson in humility. I know I've done that more than once. I'm sure that you have as well. So even when it comes to praying with real intent, if that's what it means, that can be very dangerous. It can be very dangerous. You also have to have faith in Christ. Now, I would think that many of the people that have probably prayed this, do have a faith in Christ. But you can understand that if you had even all those three elements and you came up to the conclusion that the Book of Mormon was not true, the Mormon is not going to think, wow, what did I miss? What have I done wrong? I better recheck this and maybe leave the Mormon church. They're not going to do it. In other words, it's a no-win scenario. You can't win unless you come up with a conclusion that they want you to come up with. And this is why I think Moroni 10.4 is really a, a, a ridiculous test. In fact, I've talked to some thinking Mormons who have actually come to my conclusion on this as well, that it, it can become very dangerous to use prayer in such a way. 
And again, it's not because we don't believe in prayer. We most sincerely do believe in prayer. I do feel prayer is very, a very sacred thing that God has given us. And I certainly don't want to use it in a way uh, that would not be honoring to him. I have a question. Millions of skeptics have come to Christ after a thorough examination of the Bible's claims. If the God of the Bible is also behind the Book of Mormon, why can't we approach it with the same amount of skepticism? You'll find that most of the testimonies that you read of converts to Mormonism had something to do with the Book of Mormon, and usually it was through this method of prayer or subjective feeling that they had that told them that the book was true. But let's think about it. At the same time, I asked a gentleman this on the streets of Manti years ago. I said, wouldn't you agree with me that ever since the missionaries have been using the Moroni 10-4 approach, that probably far more people have taken that advice and come up with a negative feeling regarding the Book of Mormon than a positive feeling? I says, think about it, all the years, we have right now, what, 13.8 million members of the the LDS Church. Wouldn't you imagine that over the years, just taking that number that we have now, that probably way more than 13 million have probably prayed that prayer and not embraced it as true, did not think it was true. And this guy had to admit to me, well, you know, the odds are you're, you're probably right. I says, you see, here's the problem here. If you're going to say that a feeling is what determines the truth or or error of the Book of Mormon, and yet you admit to me that probably far more taken this advice and not got the required answer that you're hoping for, if feelings was really the determinant of truth, why do you so out of hand dismiss their feelings? Unless you're actually accusing them of lying, perhaps? You see... You can't go by that. You can't go by that uh, method. There's a lot of flaws in that method. And just because you might pray for something to be true, if it in fact is false, no amount of prayer in the world is going to change the fact that it's false. Praying that a strychnine tablet is really aspirin is not going to change the contents, even if you feel that that strychnine tablet is going to cure your headache, which it will ultimately forever. (laughs) But what I'm getting across here, it does not change the facts. It doesn't change the facts. And this is why I I don't feel that this is, is really a good test. Now, from what I study, I find that Even though Mormons, all of them, would love you to pray Moroni's prayer, I find that there are some, and one of them here is the late Hugh Nibley, who was a BYU professor, who made this statement that tends to tell us that maybe it's okay to examine some of the claims of the Book of Mormon. And he makes this interesting statement that he made back in 1953. It was printed in the Improvement Era, November 1953, page 831. He says, we can never prove absolutely what the Book of Mormon is, what it claims to be. But any serious proven fault in the work would at once condemn it. Now, the reason I bring this up is because in order to find a serious proven fault, you've got to go beyond the subjective experience of prayer. Would you agree with me on that? So in other words, I'm getting the impression that Mr. Nibley is inviting us to look at some of these things and to see whether or not the claims made for the book really stand. He says, if I assume the Book of Mormon to be fraudulent, then whatever is correct in it is merely a lucky coincidence. And he's right. That's probably, you know, if we don't believe something to be true, but it happens to get something right, well, look, you've got so much information in it, it's bound to hit something correct every once in a while, so that really doesn't prove a whole lot. And so I would agree with him there. But he says, devoid of any real significance, but if I assume that it is true, then any suspicious passage is highly significant and casts suspicion on the whole thing, no matter how much of it is right. So we're not saying that there isn't some truth in the Book of Mormon. I'm almost using one of their own slogans. Well, all churches have some truth. You know, I'm not saying the Book of Mormon won't have some things in it that are accurate. I mean, when you plagiarize, you know, several passages out of the Bible, of course it's going to have some truth in it from our worldview perspective. 
But does that mean that a lot of what it has to say is something that we should really believe and embrace? Mormon apostle Jeffrey Holland, in his book, Christ in the New Covenant, page 345 to 346, I think makes a very interesting statement that we need to take to heart. And I think we ought to use it when, you know, we have the uh, opportunity to challenge our LDS friends on some of these issues. He says, to consider that everything of saving significance in the church stands or falls on the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, and by implication, the prophet Joseph Smith's account of how it came forth is as sobering as it is true. It is a sudden death proposition. Either the Book of Mormon is what the prophet Joseph said it is, or this church and its founder are false, a deception from the first instant onward. Now look very carefully at what he's telling us to do. Obviously, to set forth a challenge like that, we have to go beyond the element of Moroni 10. We have to. Uh, because how would we really know all these things merely th like, like praying a yes and no prayer? And that's basically what you're doing with Moroni 10. He says, the prophet Joseph Smith's account of how it came forth. How did the Book of Mormon come forth? And also, what Joseph Smith said the Book of Mormon is. What does it teach? What does it actually say? I think this is an invitation to do just that. And, and that's what I've been doing. So we go back to the beginning when all this really started, and first of all, we start off with a story of Joseph Smith, who, living in a very crowded Smith home with his brothers, no doubt, in the same bedroom, um, he has this appearance of the angel Moroni that comes into his room, bright as noonday, talking to Joseph Smith. They're carrying on a conversation, and as Peggy Fletcher Stack wrote in one of her columns for the Salt Lake Tribune, she asks the question, Wow, all this conversation, all this bright light, and nobody else in the room woke up. That's interesting. Uh, now, a Mormon could easily claim, well, that was a miracle, and I have no way of disproving that, so I'd have to probably go along with that. It's, this is not an argument. It's not a sword worth falling on, so I would give them at least that. But we know that it was the angel, Moroni, as he came to be known, who told Joseph Smith about the gold plates that would contain the Book of Mormon. He says, as, as recorded in Joseph Smith's history, that he called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the present, uh, presence of God to me and that his name was Moroni. He said there was a book deposited written upon gold plates, gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent, this continent, and the source from whence they sprang. In other words, where did these people come from? He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. So the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it. Now I take that as a statement saying that what we find in the Book of Mormon should be enough in order for us to reach salvation to obtain the good news, the gospel, even as the Mormons seem to define it. And of course, we run into some problems with that because when you ask most Latter-day Saints, did the Nephites believe, dot, 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 that God was a glorified, perfected human being? You can't say yes because there's nothing in the Book of Mormon that supports that. Or do you, did the Nephites believe that God has, or we have a heavenly mother a Mormon could not prove that the Nephites believe that because it's not in the Book of Mormon. It's silent on these issues. And you could go through a long list of things that Mormons believe today that a Mormon could not prove that Nephites believed because it's not in the Book of Mormon. In other words, a lot of these things came about later on. Now, Joseph Smith is told by Moroni to retrieve these plates in 1827. So several years is going to pass between the first time he meets Moroni and when he's finally allowed to go and collect the plates. 
The story of how he obtained them is recorded in this church manual called Church History in the Fullness of Times. It's 2003, so I'm not quoting something from the 19th or even 20th century, on page 45. This account is taken from Lucy Smith's biographical sketches of Joseph Smith the prophet, page 104 to 105. So by the fact that a church manual is citing this story, it does give validity to the account because this is a correlated manual. In other words, it's gone through the checking and rechecking by men in the Mormon church who are supposed to know what Mormon history and doctrine is really all about. It is given the stamp of approval, you might say. So the story goes like this, that Joseph Smith came up to the plates and wrapping them in a linen frock, he started through the woods thinking it might be safer than the traveled road. Now right there I'm going, hmm, based on what I'm about to read, this tends to put a little bit of a black mark on Joseph Smith's discernment. He should have stayed on the other road, okay? Thinking it might be safer than the traveled road, but just as he jumped over a log, he was struck from behind with a gun, okay? A man was hiding behind this log with a gun. And in a recent Ensign magazine, they actually had an illustration that supports this story where it shows Joseph Smith running away from a man who's got a gun that he's hanging, you know, holding over his shoulder and he's got something wrapped up under his arm. So they're actually validating what was said in this story. But just as he jumped over law, he was struck from behind with a gun. Joseph, however, was able to knock the assailant down and flee. Now, mind you, he's doing this with the plates under his arm. He knocks the assailant down and he's able to flee. He knocks down this armed man and he's able to take off running. His mother actually says that at times he ran at the top of his speed. Now, that can be a relative statement because what is the top of your speed when you're carrying plates under your arm? Obviously, you're not running as quick as you could if you didn't have them, but we're given the impression that he was able to at least outrun the attacker who was trying to steal the plates. Half a mile later, he was assaulted again, but managed to escape. And before he arrived home, he was accosted a third time. So three times from the time Joseph Smith takes the plates from their hiding place to the time he gets home about three miles away. And of course, three miles away would be like from the street in front of the Manti Temple, halfway to the McDonald's in Ephraim. That's about three miles. That's how long he is carrying this. Uh, he said, his, uh, or she said, his mother said that when he reached home, he was altogether speechless from fright and the fatigue of running. Well, I would imagine so. Um, because most Mormons that I have talked to have no problem with this story. But I find that most Mormons have never really tried to recreate the story. And of course, if you've ever been out to Manti in the past, you know that that's one of the things that I like to do is I'm going to come out tonight and I'll have my gold plates with me. And I am going to challenge Mormons to try and recreate the story, at least partial. I'm not going to ask them to try and carry them halfway to McDonald's in Ephraim because I really don't want to walk there myself. And, uh, but I do want them to, to recognize that there is a serious flaw in this account. And this is why Joseph Smith gives us the size of the gold plates. He tells us how big they were. He says that these records were engraven on plates which had the appearance of gold. Each plate was six inches wide, eight inches long, and not quite so thick as common tin. The volume was something near six inches in thickness, a part of which was sealed. So he gives us the size of the gold plates. Now this helps us immensely. Because if the plates were plates of gold, as Moroni claimed, and I know Mormons will say, yeah, but Joseph Smith, they only had the appearance of gold, to which my rebuttal is simply, well, doesn't gold have the appearance of gold? Uh, of course it does. Uh, but the reason why they will use that argument is I'm about to demonstrate something to them that they will recognize uh, makes the story sound a little unbelievable. And what is that? Well, gold weighs 1,200 pounds per cubic foot. The plates were one-sixth of a cubic foot, thanks to Joseph Smith and his measurement. We know that it's one-sixth of a cubic foot. The problem arises when we discover that if the plates were made of gold, they would have weighed around 200 pounds. 
This is what we are supposed to believe Joseph Smith is carrying under his arm. And what's that? With a, I, I, thank you, Aaron. I should bring that out. Um, remember the story of Joseph Smith when he was a young boy? He had this disease in his leg. Uh, they, they thought he was probably going to die, and the doctors decided uh, to try a, 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 some kind of an untested, untried method to, to cure him. And it did save his life, but the story tells us that from that point on, he walked with a limp. Uh, you don't often hear that when they, you know, and you certainly don't see it when you're watching Prophet of the Restoration downtown. The guy doesn't walk around with a limp. But if that's true, then that even makes the story even more unbelievable because a person who has to limp when they walk has to limp when they run. And uh, it's not that difficult to catch a person which has that kind of a handicap. But if we're going to believe the story that the angel tells Joseph Smith and that other Mormons have told as well, the plates were way too heavy for him to manage and to carry comfortably. Now the plates that I have only weigh 100 pounds. I had one, one Mormon kid says, well, why didn't, if they're 200 pounds, why don't you bring out 200 pounds worth of plates? I says, because I can't carry them. It's as simple as that. I can't get them out of the back of my car. Um, that's why I don't do it. And besides, they would probably think I bolted them to the asphalt anyway when they didn't try and when they tried to pick them up. In fact, let me ask you this. How many have been to the Utah Lighthouse bookstore and seen the demonstration uh, um, or seen the, the, the plates that Sandra has sitting there on the little table? I volunteer whenever I'm in town on Saturdays. I, I, I try to get down there as much as I can. I trade off with Randy Sweet, who works with us at MRM. But we volunteer down there on Saturdays, and uh, we've had many people come in, and I always get a kick out of people who want to lift the plates. And they are the same size that Joseph Smith said they were, only they're made of lead. And, of course, lead is lighter than gold. And what's interesting, when they try to pick up the plates, usually what happens is the person will bend over, they will grab the plates from its wooden base, and they will go to lift them up, and nothing happens. They, they don't even get them off of the table. Because their mind tells them, this isn't so big. This shouldn't be hard. So when they go to lift them, they don't realize just how heavy they really are. Now, her plates are 118 pounds. So they're about 80 pounds lighter than what they would have been uh, if had they been made of gold. But when people first try to lift them, nothing happens. They, they don't get them up at all. Then they do a second time. Okay, now they realize, hey, you know, I'm going to look, I'm going to look stupid in front of my wife if I can't lift these things. So then they really they put their legs into it and they straighten their back and then they can lift them off maybe a couple inches uh, off of the platform that they're sitting on. They're very, very heavy. And most Mormons that I have talked to, when they recognize that if the plates were really gold, they usually start making excuses for how this probably happened. One of the primary excuses that I often hear is God gave Joseph Smith supernatural strength. Or, you know, number two, Joseph Smith was a buff farm boy, okay? Uh, I don't care how buff he was, he couldn't have done this. It's, it's a physical impossibility, and, but Mormons usually will retreat to the supernatural strength argument. What I merely do is I try to explain to the Latter-day Saint that I'm talking to, in my research, I have never, ever read from any, any Mormon apologist except perhaps one, a woman who reviewed our book, Questions to Ask Your Mormon Friend, suggested that it possibly could be a supernatural strength. And really, she has no authority in the Mormon church. It's only her opinion, which is kind of like what everything a Mormon prophet teaches after they die. It's just their opinion. Um, but no Mormon apologist that I know of now will argue for supernatural strength. They don't. They just don't. And really, I find that they are the best argument against this rebuttal because if, in fact, it was supernatural strength, why are Mormon apologists trying so hard to get the weight of the plates down to a manageable size? This is why they've come up with a theory that the plates really weren't made of solid gold. They were made of tumbaga, which is partial copper, and gold. There was air gaps in between the plates, and the plates were wrinkled and things like that. They come up with all these incredible excuses to try to get the plates lighter. And some will even try to tell you that the plates were as light as 40 pounds. Now, personally, I think that's totally far-fetched and ridiculous. And even if it was 40 pounds... 
You still cannot outrun somebody carrying 40 pounds of weight if somebody wants to steal what you're carrying. You know, tucked under your arm, I don't care how you do it. And it, to understand how heavy 40 pounds is, it's very easy. Go to an Office Depot or a Staples and ask them, where is your paper department? And they take you over there and look for a box that's about 11 by 17 and about so inches deep. This is a case of, of reams of paper. A ream is 500 sheets. A case weighs about 42 pounds. Pick it up. I challenge you. Pick it up. And you will see just how heavy that is. Now remember, if you condense that weight down to a smaller size, it, it even becomes harder to carry. It, it becomes more difficult. It, the weight isn't spread out. Smith did not put these on his shoulder, and he certainly didn't do what they did in the movie. Uh, what was the name of that movie that Larry Miller produced? Um, yes, yeah, The Work in the Glory. If you remember the scene where Joseph Smith takes the plates out of the ground, he puts them in a pillowcase, and he kind of throws them over his back. And I thought, not quite. Okay. I mean, it, it makes for great theater, but you cannot reenact it like that. First of all, I don't think there's any pillowcase strong enough that could have held such a weight, and certainly Joseph Smith could not have swung them as he did in the film. But most Mormons watching it don't even think about this. See, what we're trying to do is to get them to think about this. We want them to re reenact the story, at least in their mind, and see that there are some problems here that need to have some serious consideration. How were the plates translated? Just about every picture that you will see that is produced by the Mormon church shows Joseph Smith in this prayerful position, as you can see from this cover of the Ensign Magazine, which is from February 2001. Smith is leaning over the plates in this prayerful position, and he's kind of running his fingers across the plates. And we are to assume, although you can't see in this picture, that he was dictating what he was reading over to one of his scribes. A uh, principal scribe was Oliver Cowdery. Uh, his wife was also a scribe. Uh, Martin Harris was a scribe. Um, there's a controversy now in the Mormon church uh, uh, among themselves that there was no curtain separating Joseph Smith from his scribes. Um, there's some real questionable uh, rebuttals that, uh, that they have tried to use to support that. But that's not a big issue with me. I, I'm not going to make that a huge issue. Um, but I, I don't really think whether it was a curtain or not that they actually saw the plates. I know that for a fact because God told Joseph Smith that only certain people uh, were allowed to see the plates in the first place. And uh, Emma was not one of them. She was never allowed to see the plates. In fact, even though she said she used to move the plates around on the table in the Smith home, they were always covered up. And she actually says at one time she ran her finger ac across the edges of the plates, the leaves of the plates, and they made a metallic sound. Well, if that's true, then we know they weren't made of gold because gold does not make a metallic sound when you run your fingers across thin leaves of gold like that. It will not do it. It makes a thumping sound. It's a very dense metal. It's, it doesn't make a pingy sound like tin or anything like that. How were the plates translated? David Whitmer uh, in his book, An Address to All Believers in Christ, page 12, he says Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat. And of course, the seer stone was a chocolate-colored, egg-shaped rock that Joseph found while digging a well with his brother Hiram. Smith would take this little rock and he would put it in the hat. And when he would, you know, well, I'm, I'll read it to you. I won't have to quote it. He said he would put, take the seer stone, he would put it into a hat, put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light. And in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. Of course, that would, that would be the, the English translation of this. One character at a time would appear. Under it was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe. And when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus, the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God. Now, let me go back a little bit. He said that when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct. In other words, Smith tells the scribe what he sees as far as the translation on the rock. The scribe writes it down. The scribe reads it back. 
when it was correct, another character with the interpretation would appear. In other words, it would not even go on unless it was absolutely correct. Now, we all know that if you were to look at the Book of Mormon, an 1830 edition at least, it doesn't read the same way as a modern edition. There have been many corrections made to the Book of Mormon over the years. The second edition had corrections. Other editions had corrections. And then in the, in the 1920s, many more corrections were made. In 1981, about 200 more corrections were made. Now, most of them, I will admit, were very minor. Mostly punctuation, spelling, things like that. I'm not going to hold that against it. But still, we find that there are textual changes to the Book of Mormon. That if you were to read an 1830 edition, you're going to find that it says some things that it does not say in the modern editions. Unfortunately, we don't have the original manuscript. We don't have a complete original manuscript. It was destroyed, water damage uh, to it. We have a printer's manuscript. So there's actually two manuscripts out there that we can go back and check. One Mormon has done that, and his name is uh, Royal Skousen. And he went through and he did a little bit of textual criticism on the Book of Mormon. And he came to the conclusion that there were probably well over 100,000 variants or differences in the Book of Mormon. Clint. Royal Skousen, S-K-O-U-S-E-N. He's the son of Cleon Skousen, who passed away a few years ago. But he said there were probably over 100,000 variants. Now again, as we know in studying our Bible and the variations of the text, that a variant doesn't really necessarily mean there's a huge mistake in there and it can't be trusted. It could be very, very minor. And many of these, even as Skousen points out, are very minor. But there are some significant changes. They come even, become even more significant because remember, this was supposed to be translated by the gift and power of God. It was read to the scribe when it was read back and when correct, it would go on to the next set of characters. So this is... Um, Something that, an, an element, I should say, in, in the translation of the Book of Mormon that we don't find with the Bible. This puts it really on a par higher than the Bible because we admit that our translation process must go through fallible men and there could possibly be a mistake in the transmission of the text. We will admit that. We don't have a problem with admitting that, but I would disagree with Article 8 when it says that we believe the Bible as far as it's translated correctly, because I think even most scholarly Mormons would admit that at least when talking about our New Testament, that we have a very well translated New Testament. It's translated very well. What Article 8 is trying to imply is that the scriptures were not transmitted accurately. And we know this by the way Mormons have explained Article 8. And usually the way they explain it, they don't say, for instance, that the word that is in the, in the Greek was translated inaccurately in the English. They will usually say that the Greek word is the wrong word. That's what they mean, and Mormon scholars have admitted as much. Well, that doesn't mean you believe the Bible as far as it's translated correctly. What you're really saying is you believe the Bible as far as it's transmitted correctly. But it doesn't say that in Article 8, and it becomes very confusing. Now, most missionaries that you're talking to don't even know what textual criticism is. They probably don't even know what a variant is. But it's good if you know some of these things to be able to explain to it to your Mormon acquaintance to show that you've looked into this. You've at least looked into the variants regarding to the Book of Mormon, and you kind of understand the arguments. This alone tells me that if this was actually how it was done, there shouldn't be the changes that were made later on to the Book of Mormon. I mean, if God got it right the first time, who are you to mess with it? And yet the Mormon church has done exactly that. But we go on. Joseph Smith claimed in the History of the Church, volume 4, page 461, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. By abiding by its precepts than by any other book. One year, and, and Manti, I, I, I came down with a quotation, this quotation on the top of a sheet of paper, and a clipboard, and I was doing my own little private survey just to see how Mormons would answer this. 
And I would read this to Latter-day Saints and say, do you believe this statement? Do you believe that the Book of Mormon is the most correct book of any book on earth and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book? I would say 100%, if there was anybody who said, no, I can't recall, everybody agreed with that statement. So I said, okay, great. I says, I pull out my pencil. I says, could you tell me what those precepts are that I need to follow in order to get nearer to God that I can't find in any other book? And I'd wait. And usually the answers, there were three answers. Well, it talks about faith, repentance, and baptism. And I said, well, that's fine, but the Bible talks about faith, repentance, and baptism. And it says, then, by any other book. What does the Book of Mormon have to say that I have to follow? What is so important about this book? Well, outside of faith, repentance, and baptism, I came back with a blank sheet of paper. Nobody could come up with anything they could think of in the Book of Mormon that was so necessary. The only thing they could come up were things that were not in the Book of Mormon. Well, you, you know, uh, you have to belong to the Mormon church, you have to pay a full tithe, you have to have your temple endowments, you have to be married in the temple. None of those things are in the Book of Mormon. A Nephite, if the Book of Mormon tells us what they really believed, wouldn't have known those things. And that's where I come up with a question, well, did the Nephites believe that? Because I know the Nephites had their, their hard times, but there were times when the Nephites, according to the narrative, had their good times, and they were good people, and they were trying very hard to do what is right. And I have to assume that if they were doing what's right, they should believe like modern Mormons. But yet, if you look at the Book of Mormon, and you read about the story of the Nephites, they don't really sound like ancient Mormons. They sound more like confused Protestants. They, they get something right on one page, and they get it wrong on the next. There's not a consistency there. And a lot of the things that Mormons certainly hold dear today are not things that you can find in the Book of Mormon. Well, if it's the most correct book on earth, let's very quickly go through some of these issues. Is it really the most correct book anthropologically? And if we read the title page to the Book of Mormon, it says, Wherefore, it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also of the Lamanites, written to the Lamanites, which are a remnant of the house of Israel. What is that telling us? It's telling us that the story that we are going to be reading here about the Nephites and the Lamanites is a story about a people who are a remnant of the house of Israel, that they have Hebrew roots. And as we read the, the Book of Mormon account, we find this verified in Alma chapter 10, verse 3. It says that Lehi, the father of Nephi and Laman, was a descendant of Manasseh. Well, Manasseh was very much a Hebrew, okay? Um, so we would have to assume if he's connected with them, that with, with Manasseh and his lineage, that there would have to be Hebrew DNA in, Nephi, in Lehi and also his offspring, in fact, we are told so much that, you know, of course, we know that the Lamanites are the descendants of the modern Indian. And Harold B. Lee, a Mormon president of the church, in his book Decisions for Successful Living, page 167, says the Indians on the American continent are descendants of the tribe of Ephraim, Judah, and Manasseh. We are told by the Book of Mormon. Omni uh, 15 through 19, 1 Nephi 5, 14 through 16, their dark skin was a curse put upon them because of their transgression, which in a day to come in their descendants will be lifted and they will become a white and delightsome, as white and delightsome as they accept the gospel and turn to the Lord. Now, of course, this phrase white and delightsome comes from what, 2 Nephi 30, verse 6. Um, and let me see if I've got that. I, I think I have that one a little out. Well, let me go back. We can talk about it possibly later. It comes from 2 Nephi 30, verse 6, where it says that when the dark-skinned Lamanites will embrace the, the Mormon gospel, the Book of Mormon gospel, that generations would not pass before they became white and delightsome. And even though modern editions of the Book of Mormon have changed the word white to pure, the word white is in the printer manuscript. We do know that. You can actually see the printer manuscript. It's online. It's not put out there by the Mormon church, but it is online, and you can actually read the, the printer manuscript for yourself. I checked it. It does say white and delightsome. It does not say pure. That was made uh, later on. It was made, I think, in the second or third edition, and then for years, it got changed back, for some reason, back to white, 
and then it was changed back to pure in the 1981 edition. Uh, again, you have to ask, well, if Smith read the word white on the, on the seer stone, and it was read back to him white, why did anybody want to change it to pure? Because clearly, when we look at the context of that passage, as well as other passages about skin color, and we know until 1978, skin color said a lot about your spirituality in the Mormon church. If you were a person of African heritage, of course, you know, you were the seed of Cain and you were banned from holding the Mormon priesthood. The reason you were born with a black skin and a flat nose, that's what Brigham Young said, I didn't say that, um, is because that was a mark put on you to let others know that you were not as valiant in the preexistence as you could have been. Now, the Mormons now are saying that that's pure folklore and that was never a doctrine. That's a lie. It was a doctrine. It was called a doctrine in a First Presidency statement. And to say that it was just folklore is, is an incredible, uh, it, it's an inc incredible untruth, to be as nice as I possibly can with that. But that's what they're trying to tell us now. And it, it, there's just too much evidence out there to say otherwise. I want you to look at Second Nephi. Chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, I, I probably should have had it already and typed out for you on the slide, but if, if you don't have a Book of Mormon, share with somebody near you. The reason I bring this up is, of course, that they have found through an extensive study over the past several years that there is not a genetic link between the American Indians and the Hebrew people. It's gone. Now, the Mormon apologists have come up with a unique explanation to that. They refer to it as genetic drift, and they try to tell us that the reason we don't find a link is because when Lehi arrived in the New World on this continent, the Nephite and Lamanite people eventually started uh, intermarrying with the indigenous people that were already here. And over the, over the years, that genetic pool was diluted to where now we don't see a, gen, a, a genetic link. This is the argument that they use. That argument becomes problematic if we're going to believe the Book of Mormon is really the word of God. Because it says in 2 Nephi chapter 1, verse 8, And behold, it is wisdom that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations. See, if there were, this is really true, there should not have been indigenous people intermingling with the Nephites and Lamanites at this particular time. It says, for behold, many nations would overrun the land that there would be no place for an inheritance. See, it's absolutely essential, according to this passage, for us to be able to know who the Lamanites really are. That's very important. They have to be able to be pinpointed as far as a culture, as a race. In verse 9, it says, Wherefore I, Lehi, have obtained a promise that inasmuch as those whom the Lord God shall bring out of the land of Jerusalem shall keep his commandments, they shall prosper upon the face of the land, and they shall be kept from all other nations, that they may possess this land unto themselves." And if it so be that they shall keep his commandments, they shall be blessed upon the face of this land, and there shall be none to molest them, nor to take away the land of their inheritance, and they shall dwell safely forever. Now, many Mormon apologists have looked to that phrase where it says, if they keep the commandments. And we know by reading the Book of Mormon, the Nephites were not always good at keeping the commandments. So that's their kind of a, their excuse. I think that excuse might be good, if they could show us where in the Book of Mormon these other nations started encroaching upon the Nephites when they broke the commandments. There is no reference for that that we find. This is something that had to come about later on, which is far, far later on in time, which certainly would give us a pretty good gene pool to work from if it happened much later in time and not at the very beginning as they're trying to presuppose. So I don't think that saying that somehow the genetic pool was diluted and that's why we don't see a link is a very good reason to just throw that out. Um, we find this statement, Dr. Trent Stevens, who teaches at Idaho State, wrote an article called Now What? in Sunstone Magazine, March 2004, page 26. He says, no genetic evidence specifically supports the hypothesis that Native Americans descended from Middle Eastern populations. Furthermore, there is little reason to assume that additional data will reverse the current conclusions. 
We find also Dr. Daniel Peterson from BYU in his Prolegomena to the DNA Essays uh, in the Farms Review, volume 15, number 2, 203. Page 32 says, to the best of my knowledge, no serious Latter-day Saint scholar or scientist contends that to date, Research on Amerindian DNA provides significant affirmative support for the Book of Mormon. So that's not a good way for them to try and prove the Book of Mormon story has some scientific validity. They stay away from that, as they probably should, because it's not very convincing. Again, as I was mentioning, the white and delightsome. Uh, in 2 Nephi 30, verse 6, And when shall the remnant of our seed know concerning us how that we came out from Jerusalem, and that they are the descendants of the Jews, and the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be declared among them, and their scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes, and many generations shall not pass away among them, save they shall be a white and delightsome people. Spencer Kimball, in particular, used to point to this passage to explain that the Indians on the Navajo reservation that were in the Mormon uh, Indian placement program were actually turning shades lighter in their skin color. So he refers to this as a verse that is talking about where the word white is actually a reference to skin. It's not talking about their purity as Mormons are led to believe to today. We have many passages in the Book of Mormon that... Uh, uh, still it have not been changed that point to skin color and it, and it supposedly being white. And as I mentioned earlier, until 1981, only the 1840 edition used the word pure. Mormon apologists insist the change was made for clarification. Uh, the printer manuscript clearly says white, and it certainly couldn't have been for clarification because it's only made things more cloudy. Uh, skin color and spirituality, we have 2 Nephi 521. And he had caused the cursing to come upon them. And in context, it's speaking of Nephi's people. Yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. What is this implying? That a skin of blackness is not going to be enticing to other people. There's a little bit of what we have 19th century racism, certainly, in the Book of Mormon. There's no doubt about this. And a lot of Mormon leaders actually, you know, were a part of that culture and reflected a lot of that racism in some of their writings. Um, some of the statements made by early leaders are probably considered very offensive, even by modern Latter-day Saint standards, like when Joseph Fielding uh, Smith refers to blacks as darkies, for instance. Um, that probably wouldn't go over very well. And uh, uh, there, there's others that I will not put on a recording, uh, lest I be taken out of context and someone attribute it to me and not a Mormon leader. But we also have 3 Nephi 2, 14 and 15, those Lamanites who had united with the Nephites were numbered among the Nephites and their curse was taken from them and their skin became white like unto the Nephites. This just is not happening. It's not happening. And of course, I think that is why uh, it made it necessary for the church to change that passage in 2 Nephi 30. Is it the most correct archaeologically? Mesoamerican anthropologist Dr. Michael Coe, back in 1973, gave a talk, wrote an article, um, and presented this to a group of Mormons, and he said the bare facts of the matter are that nothing, absolutely nothing, has ever shown up in any New World excavation which would suggest to a dispassionate observer that the Book of Mormon, as claimed by Joseph Smith, is a historical document relating to the history of early migrants to our hemisphere. Now, this is a non-Mormon scientist who I don't think has a dog in this fight, okay? He's, he's not, he wouldn't be classified even by, I think, the most rabid Mormon as being an anti-Mormon, whatever that is. He's just telling what he has observed through his research. This is what he's relating. When I would use this quote with Latter-day Saints, they would, of course, say, but Bill... That thing was back 1973. That's an old quote, certainly. They found lots of things since, yet, since then. Why, well, just yesterday they found dot, 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 and then I would hear all sorts of wild folklore that could never be substantiated, but it was faith-promoting to them, and that's why they were relating it to me. And so they kind of threw this quote out as being out of date. Well, in 1993, I decided 
to write Dr. Ko myself and to see after 20 years, two decades, if he had changed his view. This is what Dr. Ko wrote to me. He said, Dear Mr. McKeever, I haven't changed my views about the Book of Mormon since my 1973 article. I have seen no archaeological evidence before or since that date which would convince me that it is anything but a fanciful creation by an unusually gifted individual living in upstate New York in the early 19th century. He's not seen any evidence that has come to light since his 1973. Now, you might say, well, 19, you know, 93, that's a long time ago, Bill. Certainly they found a lot of things since then. How many remember the series, The Mormons? When it aired here on the PBS channel, it was the talk of the town. Everybody was waiting to see what's this thing going to be all about. And so they... They had a bunch of interviews on camera, but then they also had a lot of online interviews that you could go and read for yourself. And on the website, they had an interview with Dr. Michael Coe, who was also featured in, in the documentary, in which Dr. Coe says this. Now, mind you, this is 2007. We're not too far, far too, too, not too long ago. In the case of the Book of Mormon, he says, you've got a much bigger problem. You really do. We have other, another part of the world where the archaeology is really very well, know, well known now. We know a lot about people like the Maya and their predecessors. So to try to find unlikely evidence in an unlikely spot, you've got a problem. And of course, none of the finds that biblical archaeologists are rightly proud about, no finds on that level have ever come up for Mormon archaeologists, which makes it a big problem. They, he is admitting there's nothing. There is nothing. Yet how many times have I had Mormons tell me that they're finding all sorts of stuff? How Didn't we just read earlier where Ezra Taft Benson said, there's plenty of evidence to support it in that kind of a scientific uh, way. But yet here is a scientist who, again, as I say, has no dog in this fight. He's, he's not prejudiced one way or another when it comes to the religious issues of Mormonism that I know of. I've never heard him say anything like that who's merely relating his research from the field of science that he is an expert in. And he says, you've got a problem. There's no evidence that supports it. Now, the Mormons have been using this one. This is their big trump card now. Nahum, the Nahum stone. In 1 Nephi 1634, it reads, And it came to pass that Ishmael died and was buried in the place which was called Nahum. And so Mormons say, ah, see, here's a Book of Mormon location, and they found this rock that has three letters on it, NHM. And they're assuming that this, this is where Ishmael must have died and was buried. This is proof. And this is the arguments that they use. In the end sign, February 2001, in an article called Book of Mormon Linked to Site in Yemen, in the country of Yemen, page 79, did you notice the page number? Page 79. It's almost on the, in the last pages of the Ensign magazine. You would think if this was really news, this would have been the headline. But it's back on page 79, and it's only maybe a quarter or maybe a third of a page, the article itself. It's a filler article. That's what we call it at MRM, a filler article. Okay? where it says a group of Latter-day Saint researchers recently found evidence leaking a site in Yemen on the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula to a name associated with Lehi's journey as recorded in the Book of Mormon. They are saying that this stone is verifying a place in the Book of Mormon. BYU professors, uh, Professor S. Kent Brown writing about this in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, where I think this was a cover story for them, but nobody reads this, okay? Very few people read the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. It's not like the Ensign, which is made for the general membership. This is more of a, a limited uh, publication. He says, although, now listen carefully to what he says, although we cannot determine that at the time there was a place called Nim or Nehem, it is reasonable to surmise, reasonable to whom? Not to most people, but for a Latter-day Saint it would be reasonable because you've got nothing else. He says it is reasonable to surmise that the tribe gave its name to the region where it dwelt. Was it this name that Nephi rendered Nahom in his record? Very probably. Very probably. 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 
Would you, would you bet your house on that? Very probably. Now, this is a man who I'm sure wants it to be true, but he's being honest enough to admit that it's not really overwhelming evidence. It, it really isn't, even though Mormons have latched on to this. Now, why have they latched on to it? This is what the article says toward the end. It says, this is the first archaeological find that supports a Book of Mormon place name other than Jerusalem or the Red Sea. And even that is tenuous. Basically what they're saying to a person like myself who has studied this issue is, you got squat. That's really what it's saying. You've got nothing. So when you hear Mormons saying, oh, they found all these things that validate the Book of Mormon story, this is the Ensign Magazine saying, look, if you got the Naam stone, you got one. Okay? You got one. And even that is questionable. I remember talking to a Mormon apologist, and he thought he was going to be cute, and he said, well, how many place names have been verified in the Bible? And, and he said something, I think the number he said was something like 73. And he was acting as if that was nothing. And I'm thinking in my head, well, that's 73 to zip. I mean, I would much rather take the 73 than the nothing. And, and yet we find that most Latter-day Saints, unfortunately, would cast aside the Bible, which does have a lot of historical validity. We know that there's stories of real people and real events. We don't know that about the Book of Mormon. We have to take it by faith. To date, no Book of Mormon city has been verified. No Book of Mormon artifact has been found. Mormon tours to Book of Mormon locations are merely speculative. Even when the Foundation of Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, now known as the Neil Maxwell Institute, conducted a tour down into Central America that they think are the Book of Mormon uh, locations, they all said thought to be, could be, maybe. They were never really and they had to be very speculative about it. Exactly. We have two groups now that have kind of sprung up and are competing in the Mormon church for where the Book of Mormon uh, locations are. You have the Rodney Meldrum group, which holds to a more traditional kind of uh, Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery view, that the Book of Mormon lands are up in New York, because after all, that's where Joseph Smith found the plates. And then you have the BYU crowd that wants to insist that it was down in Central America. And that brings me to this picture here. <laughs> Oh, I love it when Aaron does that. <laughs> Just recently in the Mormon Times, this was the cover story. The fight over Book of Mormon geography. And of course it shows two people going in two different directions pointing to their, their favorite spot. This is an in-house debate, one that I just stand back and watch them go after it, each other. I don't have to say anything, and I think they're both wrong, of course, but if they are very heated in this discussion, and when you read some of the arguments, boy, the, you know, it's, it's like, you know, talking to a King James only person, you know, and trying to introduce the NIV, ah, that's never going to happen. Uh, but it says, debate is heated, but is it necessary for one's salvation to know the location? I would argue and say, I wouldn't think so. Where it actually happened, I don't think is a salvific issue, even within the context of Mormonism. But why is it important? Because Mormon prophets have pinpointed locations. They have said that this is where these places are. And now we're supposed to believe you want Latter-day revelation from living prophets of God, but yet we can't hold them accountable for what they say? That's basically what Mormons are expecting us to do. I can't do that. If these men are really speaking for God when they say these things, unless they are speaking irresponsibly, and that would, I think would raise all sorts of doubts to everything else they've ever said, we have to take what they say at face value. And believe me, a lot of Mormon leaders have been very specific about where the Book of Mormon locations are and who the people of Lehi are. Even as recent as Gordon B. Hinckley, when dedicating a temple down in Central America, he said that the offspring of Lehi were in the crowd. He actually made comments like that. Others made comments like that. And it's important that they know who the Lamanite people are. Otherwise, again, as I mentioned from the title page of the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon loses its, it loses its importance because it is written for the Lamanites. It's written for them. Is it the most correct doctrinally? Okay, if it's the most correct doctrinally, what do we do with this passage? In Mosiah 15, 1 through 2. 
God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. And having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son. Clearly, from a theological standpoint, we read this and we go, that's modalism. That's an early Christian heresy that is being espoused in the Book of Mormon. And others have seen it as that as well. Mormons certainly don't believe that, that it's the Father and the Son in that kind of a context. And I keep it with the context. Uh, they would, of course, separate the, the persons and make three separate gods within the Mormon Godhead. It certainly wouldn't go in this extreme direction. Mormonism goes in the other direction, at least nowadays. Then, of course, we have the second Nephi, 25-23. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Now, on the streets, you might hear some Mormons argue, well, that really means in spite of all we can do. That's not how Mormon leaders have interpreted this passage. They have made it very clear that you must do all that you can possibly do in order to achieve the best the Mormon religion has for you. In the manual, True to the Faith, page 77, and this just came out, what, in 2004, through grace made available by the Savior's atoning sacrifice, all people will be resurrected and receive immortality, but resurrection alone does not qualify us for eternal life in the presence of God. Our sins make us unclean and unfit to dwell in God's presence, and we need his grace to purify and perfect us after all we can do. It makes it very clear. You do all you can do, then you get that purification. You get that grace that purifies and forgives you of your sins. True to the faith, page 77 says the phrase after all we can do teaches that effort is required on our part to receive the fullness of God's grace and be made worthy to dwell with him. Well, what does that mean all, after all we can do? Does anybody really do all they can do? Are you consistent at that? I have to admit, I've been a Christian since 1973 and I've had my good days and I've had my bad days. I don't always do all I can do and even at my best I don't think I'm really doing all that I can do. Uh, but yet, that's what Mormons are told must be accomplished if they hope to achieve celestial exaltation. Then we have Alma 1137. This passage usually comes up as we are trying to discuss the doctrine of grace with Latter-day Saints. Usually they bring it up. At least in my experience, I've had Mormons oftentimes bring this passage up in an attempt to refute my belief from the New Testament that I'm justified by faith. It says, and I say unto you again that he, speaking of God, cannot save them, in the context, the, his people, in their sins, for I cannot deny his word. And he has said that no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, how can you be saved except you inherit the kingdom of heaven? Therefore, you cannot be saved in your sins. Well, a very simple question to ask a Latter-day Saint was, is if this verse is really true, and I might admit to you that Technically, as it reads, I believe it. I, I agree with what this is saying. The question is, of course, how do we become clean? I know no unclean thing is going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. The question is, how do we become clean? And if you asked a Mormon if they were clean right now, they wouldn't know. How many have ever last, asked a Latter-day Saint? Do you know right now, if you were to die, that you are clean, as it says in Alma 1137, that all your sins are forgiven, and you would receive the best your religion has to offer? The Mormon says, I hope so. But they don't know. They don't know. Remember the concept of the ladder? For every good work, the Mormon goes up a rung. For every bad work, they were told, it's a sliding to the bottom. You ask a Mormon, how tall is this ladder? What rung are you on? They don't know. The only way they would know where they're at is if they've just sinned and they know they're at the bottom. Not very encouraging. Roy Doxey answers the question on how a Mormon gets clean. He was a part of the Church Correlation Department, and in his book, Prophecies and Prophetic Promises from the Doctrine and Covenants, pages 168 and 169, he said, the just are those who are defined in the prophetic promise as members of Christ's church through baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost by an authorized servant of the Lord. They become clean from sin by keeping the commandments. That's how they become clean. And they are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, that seal must be like Velcro. Because they aren't always keeping the commandments. 
You want to know how you can know that? Ask a Mormon if he repents. They all say they repent. Well, if they repent, that means they broke a commandment, right? So it, they're, they're coming in and out all the time. That's one revolving door that they have, and they can never know where they're at. And then, of course, we have the famous Moroni 1032. Come unto Christ, be perfected in him, deny yourself of all ungodliness. And if you shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God you are perfect in Christ, you can in no wise deny the power of God. Ask a Mormon, have they denied themselves of all ungodliness? I've not accomplished that. I know I haven't. Uh, I, but it's only by denying them, themselves of all ungodliness that they can hope to have the grace that's sufficient. Sufficient to do what? Well, actually to forgive them of their sins. That's when it becomes efficacious, as we read in this explanation by Joseph Fielding McConkie and Robert Millett in their doctrinal commentary on the Book of Mormon, volume 1, page 295. Indeed, it is only after a person has so performed a lifetime of works and faithfulness, only after he has come to deny himself of all ungodliness, and then they add this phrase, Every worldly lust. That's not in the Book of Mormon. That's in the Joseph Smith translation of the New Testament. That's where they get this phrase. That the grace of God, that spiritual increment of power, is efficacious. That's when it kicks in. You ask the Latter-day Saint, are you doing that? And of course they're not. You ask a Mormon, well, you have to keep commandments in order to be forgiven? Yes. How many commandments must you keep? They will usually say all of them. How often must you keep them? All of the time. How are you doing at that? Silence. <laughs> or not very good. That's a tragedy. They cannot have the assurance that the New Testament gospel actually gives us. So in closing, let me say that when a Mormon tells you to ignore the facts and instead seek a feeling, you might remind them that John, the Apostle John, 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, Believe not every spirit, but try, and this word in the Greek to try is to examine or test. It doesn't say pray. It says to try the spirits, whether they are of God. Why are we to do this? Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. That is our worldview, folks. That is how we determine truth. We have to examine what they say and compare it to something outside of ourselves, which of course is the Word of God, the Bible. If it doesn't match up to that, then we throw it out and we have no fear whatsoever of the false prophet and whatever thing he might say against us. That's how it works. That's what we're hoping to get across to our LDS friends and loved ones. Let's, let's close in, in prayer. Father, we thank you for once again, allowing us to have this great opportunity to be able to share your good news with a people that are very dear to us, a people that live among us, that are related to us, that work with us. Um, we pray that we might do this in a way which gives you glory. And we pray that we might be able to present some of these truths and, and, and pray that the Holy Spirit will use it to open eyes and touch hearts so that those that we love so dearly will come to know you as we do. Again, we thank you for this opportunity. Let us not waste it away, but yet us use wisely the time that you have given us to declare what you have for the Mormon people here in Manti during these upcoming two weeks. We thank you for what you have done in the past. We glorify you for the souls that we have seen that have come to know you as personal Savior. As a result of these efforts, we thank you, Lord, because we know our efforts are so feeble. They're so feeble. Even our best effort is sin tainted. But somehow you take those efforts. Why? I don't really know. But you use them to honor yourself, and we thank you for that. Thank you for the encouragement that you have given us to see the results of our efforts here. And we ask that you do so again in these upcoming days, and we give you the praise ahead of time for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I give it back to Chip.